Um, yeah, so with the traditional architecture, you probably set up a new host. You will configure the services running on top of it. You would also configure uh, like a monitoring agent to pull logs and metrics for them on certain intervals. Uh, you might have had some configuration management tools that helps you on the way, but things were pretty much static, right? Uh, however, these days, I saw how many that are using uh, containers. The, uh, the world is much more dynamic. Deployments, they grow, they, they shrink, they sometimes disappear. Containers move from one node to another. And that puts a lot of challenge for the, especially around operations, how to know are my workloads okay, is my cluster healthy, and so on. And that's where what I will uh, talk about today, how the Elastic Stack can help you to observe uh, your application and services and the cluster itself uh, using the, the Elastic Stack. So uh, my name is Eric Westberg, uh, and I'm a solution architect. I'm based here in Stockholm. I've been with Elastic for one and a half year now. Um, and, and I don't know how many that of you that are familiar with the, with the Elastic Stack. Uh, can I get a hands up for those that know Elastic Stack at least? How many are using it today? Ah, that's a good, good turn up. But for you that didn't raise the, the hands, don't worry. I will quickly go through the, the stack here as well. So uh, also you can follow here a bit as well. Uh, the Elastic Stack, it also went with a name called the ELK Stack. And that was an abbreviation for Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. But since we added more components to the stack, the, the marketing team tried to come up with new funny uh, animal style type of names like Belk that didn't really work out well. So the marketing team took the the easy way out as I see it uh, and just call it Elastic Stack. Uh, but in the middle of the Elastic Stack, you have the, the, the heart of it, the Elastic Search. And Elastic Search is um, uh, where we store all the, the documents, all the data that you want to have searchable, and it's horizontal scalable. So you can scale Elasticsearch from from one one node on a laptop to uh, to server farms that are you have hundreds of nodes. I think the biggest Elasticsearch cluster I've seen or heard about is like a 400 node cluster. So it's like massive amount of data. We're talking about petabytes, if not exabytes of data. And everything is searchable at near real time, as it is. That's the strength of Elasticsearch. To get your data into Elasticsearch, we have two components. Uh, one is called Beats. It's a family of, of, of uh, components. And it's a, basically a lightweight data shipper written in Go. So the whole purpose is to collect metrics and logs and data and ship it to uh, Elasticsearch. And this is what you install on the edge of your servers and clusters and so on to pick up the data. You also have a component called Logstash. Logstash is uh, the stack's uh, uh, ETL tool, basically to normalize the data, to transform the data, and uh, maybe also enrich the data before sending it in, into Elasticsearch. And then uh, on top of the stack, you have the, the, the UI, the web UI into Elasticsearch, which is called Kibana. And that allows you to explore and visualize the data you have in Elasticsearch. And everything you see here is, is open source under the Apache 2 license. So it's, you're free to download and uh, install it and play with it and run it uh, and distribute it yourself. Uh, Back a bit to uh, Kubernetes, and yeah, Kubernetes has really taken the world of containerized architecture world by storm. Uh, actually, it also allows, let's say, the, the operations to stop worrying about individual servers, thanks to the, the clustered nature of uh, Kubernetes. Uh, and it also put a lot of power into the hands of the, the application developer teams, as they can now deploy and, and manage their own workloads on the machines. Something that is, of course, crucial for uh, quick um, 
development and release times of your software. And I meet a lot of different organizations and customers. And some are you know, everything from the startup to the most, you could say, conservative organizations. And I think everyone has some kind of plan to move into some kind of containerized architecture today. So you have this type of different uh, flavors of, uh, of Kubernetes. You have, of course, for those that want to run on-prem with uh, examples like Pivotal and, and Red Hat's uh, OpenShift. And then you have the, the public cloud uh, offerings from, uh, from players like Google, uh, Amazon, and, and Azure as well. Uh, <coughs> but as Kubernetes also simplifies a lot of the, the deployment tasks uh, for, for the operations, it also introduces a lot of complexities on the day-to-day -day task. And that is, like, say, how do I know that my clusters uh, are running healthy and the applications are running healthy? Uh, and this is uh, where the concept of what we call observability comes into the place. And the concept of observa observability uh, is a concept that uh, the Twitter uh, was pioneering uh, when they monitored their, their huge distributed architecture. And it's built on, on three pillars. Uh, you have the pillars of metrics, things that are aggregatable numbers like CPU load and memory and so on. Uh, you have things like logs or logging, like discrete events happening in your applications. If something goes bad or an error, your application probably writes a log of it. And the last pillar is about tracing data, basically data about uh, requests and transactions, how it traverses through your uh, probably distributed system. And these three form what we call this observability. And it's really important to have a view into all these three, uh, uh, three pillars to, to gain a good visibility into your, your, your Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and the whole concept of observability resonates very well with the story around Elastic and Elastic Stack. Uh, Elastic Stack is say, one solution where you can ingest analyze and visualize and take action on all this type of data. So you can ingest the metrics, the logs, and of course also the tracing data. So you have everything in one, say, pane of the glass. So if you want to do uh, debug your software or, or uh, want to find some root cause analysis, you have, say, one tool to, to work out of. So let's start with the, the first, say, pillar, the, the logging pillar. Uh, and I think most applications and systems emit logs today. Uh, and it's, like I said, really great to, to know what's happening inside a cluster, to know it's up, uh, up and running and so on. Uh, and the recommended way for containerli containerized applications is to uh, emit logs via uh, the standard out or standard error out streams. Uh, <coughs> but uh, yeah, there you go. But Kubernetes does not come with a native logging solution. You have something called uh, kubectl logs, and it's basically like a command line uh, tool that you use to view uh, some of the logs, but it's not really scalable in, in large Kubernetes clusters. And if your container crashes, if uh, if your pod gets evicted or, or a node dies, then you still probably still want to be able to access your logs. So therefore, the, the recommendation is that you do what we call cluster level logging, that you have a separate backend to centralize all your logs and send those to. Uh, and you do that with uh, what we call a node level agent that collects the logs and sends it to, uh, to the backend. You also have another alternative if you look into the Kubernetes uh, documentation, and that is also called the application level logging. And that means that the application is sending the logs directly from yeah, the container directly to, to the logging backend. But that raises some questions, of course. What happens if the backend goes down or if this application crashes? Can you still access the logs and so on? So this 
with the application level logging is not really the, the recommended approach in a way. So back to cluster level logging is the recommend recommendation. And as I said, uh, Kubernetes doesn't specify the logging solution to use, but it comes with two package solutions. Uh, it comes with a stack driver for those who are running with the, in the Google, in the Google Cloud Platform. Uh, and for the rest of the distributions, you uh, are using Elasticsearch as the, uh, the logging uh, backend. But both alternatives are using uh, a logging agent called FluentD to, to collect the logs, uh, to parse the logs, and distribute the logs. And, and FluentD is, uh, is great, uh, but we say that Let's see if this is maybe too. Uh, but we say that the file bit is better. And file bit is also like a logging agent that collects logs, uh, but it also enriches the logs. So it enriches the logs with uh, contextual metadata. So you have metadata such as, uh, like, it adds information about the cloud you're running on. So uh, of course, which region, if you run it in a public cloud, uh, what type of instance it's getting the cloud from. It also adds metadata around the Docker and the container itself, the name and the ID, of course, or uh, metadata around Kubernetes, uh, like, like pod and uh, namespace. And this is, of course, really crucial if you want to debug and find, and find where's, where in my cluster do we have problem or eventual issues. So it's really useful uh, for you to, uh, say, reduce the, the time to root cause analysis and, and debug your, uh, your applications. And FileBeat comes with a really another super interesting feature. And uh, FileBeat was, uh, uh, so eBay was one of the, the one of the say, pioneers uh, around actually using what we called FileBeat without the discovery. And I think they have issued more than, uh, f I think, 40 pull requests around the Beats family and how to use this in, in, in a Kubernetes. And auto discovery is extremely useful in, in dynamic environments such as Kubernetes, as it automatically discovers those logs that you want to collect and, and send it to, uh, to Elasticsearch. And you do that using the configuration, it's super simple. Uh, you configure like a template that should be triggered based on a certain condition. So in this very example, we want to collect Nginx logs as an example. So we write in the template that if you find a container that contains the name Nginx, then you should start collecting those Nginx logs using the Nginx module. And a module in this case is uh, like a prepackaged version, so it knows exactly where those logs are located. It knows how to parse those logs if they are not, say, already in JSON example, uh, and also make meaningful field names to those logs, and also to actually do uh, visualizations of these logs in a best practice way. So you have things like dashboards or machine learning job and alerts and so on to actually use the data in the most efficient way. And we have more so-called modules than just uh, Nginx, of course. And we are constantly adding more modules. So we have modules for say, all the standard applications that you might run here. And the community is also adding a lot of modules around this as well, of course. The, the second pillar is the, the metrics. Uh, and metrics, the first question is, of course, what type of metrics should we should we monitor and what we should collect? And of course, you should collect the, the cluster metrics, uh, things like uh, the number of instances of a pod or uh, the number of expected pods that I want to have and which are, how many are in progress for deployment. Uh, you want to have network metrics. And then, of course, you also want to have uh, container metrics uh, like uh, CPU load and uh, memory consumption. Uh, and so on. And there's a lot of different metric sources in, in Kubernetes. Uh, so you have things like, uh, 
like uh, Heapster, uh, etc. But Metric Beat is the most uh, comprehensive uh, metric agent out there. It collects metrics from um, from the kubelet, from the cube state metrics, from uh, from Kubernetes event uh, server, as well as also if you're using Prometheus, can collect uh, metrics from Prometheus. And the same here, it also adds, say, metadata around the metrics as well, of course, in a similar fashion. And it also adds uh, these kind of auto dashboards, so you, you know out of the box dashboards. So it visualizes, let's say, all the Kubernetes metrics as a auto best practice view. So you can see very easily to get started with, uh, with uh, using and visualizing your, your, your metrics. And then you also have the uh, a curated application in, in Kibana called the, the uh, Infra UI. And it visualizes your Kubernetes cluster uh, and group them by different, uh, different um, uh, aspects. So you can group the, the data in this type of waffle diagram. Uh, you can group it by nodes or namespace or different pods. And you also have this kind of color coding, so you can quickly see, even if you're running thousands uh, of containers, you can quickly see if, if there's any issues if, say, one of them is showing orange or red, for instance. <coughs> oh, see, I'm walking around too much here. Uh, and in a similar fashion, in a very easy way, you can also configure auto discovery using uh, Kubernetes. In this case, again, we are trying to collect uh, Nginx metadata. And in this case, uh, we want to collect them on 10-second uh, uh, intervals in this example. But it's super easy to get started. And in the same way, we also have these modules for for other uh, typical uh, applications and systems out there. And we're continuously adding more of these modules. Really powerful, really easy to get started. It's basically one command from collection to visualization and, and usage of the data. The, uh, the third and the last pillar was the tracing. And last year, uh, Elastic um, released the very first open source uh, APM solution. APM stands for Application Performance Monitoring. So that basically tells you what's happening within your application. All the different requests and, and transactions happening within the application and also across the applications. And you also can find all these say, unhandled errors in your application as well. So this is really useful for, for knowing yeah, the performance. Because your logs might show everything is OK, you are getting 200 OK and so on, uh, but maybe a request takes 15 seconds, but you still can't see that from the logs. And the application performance monitoring will show that for you. And you can do this all this kind of analysis like the, the 95th or 99th percentile to really find the, the outliers uh, of the data. And we also support this with the distributed tracing. So you have like a standard standardization called the, the open tracing that we follow as well. But that means that you can follow the request as it traverses. For instance, if you have microservices, you can see uh, in this kind of waterfall uh, model where the bottlenecks are as the, the request uh, traverses across your different services. So in this example, we see that we have this blue service that goes to a green service, which is uh, another node. And it should also be, yeah, I cut it there. In the, in the bottom, you see like another, a third service running. So you can see how it interacts and where the bottlenecks are. And all this data is really useful. Everything here, what I showed here, is, is free and open source. So you can start trying it out uh, today if you haven't already done so. But you can do uh, so much more uh, on this data as well, of course. And we have, of course, a commercial side to Elastic Stack as well uh, with subscriptions. And what I see maybe the most useful cases, especially around Kubernetes and the monitoring, is to, uh, of course, apply alerting like threshold or rule-based alerting. If this happened, I want to get notified through either like an email or a ticket to Jira or something. 
but you can also uh, sometimes be very hard to do this kind of static thresholds. Maybe, the, of course, the cluster uh, is growing per se, and maybe the usage is growing, so it's very hard to do static um, uh, thresholds for alerts, and that's where our machine learning comes into place. So with the Elastic Stack, you have something called uh, uh, anomaly detection that finds anomalies in your time series data. So you see that if suddenly that it learns the metric from history that your, the number of users, for instance, or number of requests or uh, response time on APIs, and let you know if it's something is out of order. Um, and then, of course, you also have security to, to lock down all this, this uh, uh, all this data that we have in Elasticsearch through encryption as well as, of course, role-based access. Uh, that was a very short, to say, introduction on how you can gain observability into uh, uh, Kubernetes using the, the Elastic stack. Uh, we have a lot of webinars recorded on our website on elastic.co. Um, but otherwise, now that uh, I can take questions now, and I'm also in, in a booth here in, in Boleris booth. Uh, at, I think it's E17, uh, so I will be there during the day as well. So if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to come by and, and, and ask me there. So thank you.